Well, I'm addressing you for the sixth lecture from our International Learning Center again. I'm actually in one of the side training rooms. Uh, and I thought it appropriate as we talk about anthropology and contextualization. Because this is the place where IMB missionaries come for, it's varied from eight weeks to four weeks for training uh, to prepare for entering cultures all around the world. Uh, in fact, recently, it was just in July of 2017, that uh, President Trump visited Poland. And uh, it, it made all the news in the States because the, the word was that the First Lady of Poland uh, dissed the President of the United States. And they kept showing over and over how they're on a platform together. And there's President Trump with the First Lady from the U.S. And there's the President of Poland with his wife. And as they shook hands, the wife passed by Trump to greet his wife. And then she actually did greet Trump. But it was such a big deal that she passed by the president to greet his wife. But in Polish culture, that's exactly what you'd expect. Uh, if I enter a room and there's a man and his wife, it is always that I will go to the wife. If she extends her hand, I'll shake her hand. And then I'll shake uh, the husband's hand. And so again, it wasn't a snub. It was a different culture. Culture teaches us Rules and uh, anthropology is basically the study of man. And so they're both related to the matrix of humanity and relationships, but they come at it from a, a little different aspect. Culture literally is the learned and shared design or behavior or pattern of living for a group of people. Uh, that's actually in your book on page 138. Uh, Pratt also observes on the, the next page that the missionary's challenge is to avoid judging the culture as inferior, especially before he understands it. And, and there's a word for that, ethnocentric, uh, ethnocentrism, just like egocentric is when I focus upon myself. Well, ethnocentrism is I focus on my culture of origin. Uh, Sarah Lanier established the categories that are often used of hot climate culture and cold climate culture. And there is some correlation between literally climate, temperature. Uh, but for example, hot climate cultures, uh, their tendencies include group orientation. They're very relational. Inclusion-minded, indirect in their communication. Uh, and think more of the event at hand than what the clock says. And so that's a, a typical hot climate. Many of the Latin cultures, for example. Cold climate cultures. They tend toward individualism, a direct communication, and have a higher value on privacy. Uh, much of Europe, especially Northern Europe, would be considered cold climate cultures. Uh, there are other categories for studying culture, uh, and there are five dimensions often. Identity, hierarchy, gender, truth, and virtue the different dimensions that one must evaluate, assess, and seek to understand uh, whichever culture they enter or engage. Uh, a more prevalent and possibly valuable approach to understanding a new culture relates to three pervasive types. Again, this uh, are general types, and these three categories are guilt cultures, shame cultures, and fear cultures. Uh, the U.S., generally speaking, would be a guilt, innocence culture. Uh, Asian cultures, by and large, Islamic cultures, by and large, are more honor, shame. Uh, animistic cultures tend more toward fear and power. And this definitely influences a missionary's approach to engaging, to sharing the gospel, and to adapting in this new culture. And so that's foundational, to try to understand what's the underpinning, the underlying system or approach even to life. That is why in some cultures we totally don't understand why uh, a lady, uh, maybe even molested in an Islamic culture's brother, will kill her out of honor, an honor killing. Whereas from our cultural standpoint, that's barbaric, it, it makes no sense because we have a different lens, as it were, in which we see the world. A powerful and pervasive aspect of culture 
is language. And unfortunately, it's one of the hardest parts of being an effective missionary is to learn fluency in a different language. Uh, many people see languages as basically a different form of English, uh, just maybe a different uh, arrangement of, of syllables. Or it is a different communication system. It's not a tweaking. And so some people don't understand that translation is rarely, here's a word, and then here's a word that means the exact same thing. Uh, that's why a good translation is very hard, actually, because you've got to understand context, meaning, uh, possible meaning. Uh, a missiologist by the name of Donald Smith, uh, he's referenced on pages 146 and 147. He actually came out with a dozen different signals uh, that are part of communication. Uh, verbal, written, numeric, pictorial, artifactual, audio, kinesic, optical, tactile, spatial, temporal, and olfactory, smelling. Uh, so again, there, all of these can come into play as someone is seeking to simply communicate. And in your culture, those things are, are even undercurrent. You, you, you probably don't even notice all of them because they're congruent. But all of a sudden, you cross a cultural boundary in one, two, three, or four of these may raise up as totally incongruent, inconsistent, uh, confusing, frustrating, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, you probably have heard stories uh, of the misuse of, of gestures, for example, certain gestures in a given culture that would be appropriate or totally inappropriate. Uh, again, in Poland, where I've lived, uh, a speaker would never speak with his hands in his pocket. Uh, that's a sign of disrespect. I've asked people, nobody knows the, uh, the background of it. But, uh, and so I don't have to understand it. I just have to avoid it. And so, uh, again, I understand. I'm learning to understand after 26 years some of the uh, cultural cues, expectations, gestures, uh, nonverbal communication that, uh, that are prevalent in Poland. Uh, Moving from one context to another and adjusting an object or teaching while remaining true to the original tent is the goal of contextualization. Uh, translation work sometimes, uh, we, we find what's called the dynamic equivalent. Uh, the, the example often given for Eskimos. Uh, when the Bible is translated into their language and uh, the translator was talking to his helper there and was talking about uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he, you know what a lamb is. And the Eskimo looked, said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so he described this woolly animal. Eskimo's like, never seen one, never heard of one. I think found a picture, showed it to him. That means nothing to our people. Uh, so if you said Jesus is the Lamb of God, there's no context. They don't even know if that's an animal. And so in some translations, as it, the translator began to ask, well, what in your culture? And so to us, it would sound uh, inappropriate even to say Jesus is the seal of God. But it translated perfectly. They understood uh, a helpless animal uh, in the context that was given to die for another. Uh, I already used the example in a previous lecture about uh, a plant where you have a seed or a potted plant uh, where you move it from one context to another. And that's part of the process of enculturization. It's the, the adapting, it's putting down roots. It's always going to be a combination. No one of us. Uh, I will never be Polish. Uh, I love it when people say that I am or say that I'm very Polish or whatever. Uh, but I know. Uh, and, and sometimes people talk about going native and uh, it's one of the most embarrassing things in the world when you see people trying to act as if they are uh, indigenous or native to a culture that they're not because the only people they fool generally would be themselves. Uh, uh, again, uh, Paul addresses in the scripture uh, even the, uh, the adjustment that's needed for contextualization. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20 and following he writes, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. 
to those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Verse 22, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. So Paul talks about the adjustment that's not related to compromise, because those are two different things. But adjusting whether it's the volume in which you speak, uh, whether it is eye contact or no eye contact, these things you can train yourself uh, to be better cross-cultural witnesses. Again, in the book, on page 152, Nita and Hesselgrave provide a good tricultural model where you have biblical culture, missionary home culture, and target people's culture. And you're always trying to bridge those. Uh, when you read in the New Testament, uh, a description or even a command, it was given in a context, and that's a different context than ours. So you have to be able to bring it from that context to your home culture and then to your host culture. And so there's always this internal dialogue, as it were, to be accurate, uh, but also to be relevant. And that's where contextualization comes together. Uh, Hebert gives steps for missionaries to take in contextualizing their work. He says, first, exegete the culture. Uh, you may know that word to exegete the Bible, is to go to the Bible and bring from it its own meaning, not to read into it what we hope it says or take our issue to it, to proof text, but to pull out from it. What does the culture self reveal? What do you find from cultural observation? Some of them are very easy and some of them are very surface. Uh, some of them are much deeper and more abiding. Uh, listen to understand, not to correct, and certainly not to judge. Uh, that doesn't mean all things in culture are biblically acceptable. But again, we have to first understand before we can address. Uh, the second step, study the word and evaluate according to the clear passages how to understand a culture and how to maybe uh, bring the contrast to that culture where it may be distant from Scripture. Uh, what happens many times is missionaries begin to exegete a culture and then apply their home culture, which also isn't perfect. And so again, it, we need to apply the biblical, uh, especially the clear passages that reveal or, or make known the expectations God has for His people and for His church especially. Number three, discuss the Word, the Bible, with believers in your new culture and explore together how to respond to the Bible's clear teachings. So help shed light, and most believers will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They can usually cut through whatever baggage we may bring, though we're hoping to minimize all of that. Uh, and it is difficult, uh, because some would come to, to preach or teach uh, a capitalistic, for example, understanding of what the Bible teaches of, uh, of wealth or of use of wealth, uh, whereas the Bible is more neutral than an economic system. And that would just be one example of numerous ones that we'd have to, to face. And then fourthly, in this uh, four-fold uh, guide, is it says, gently guide the young church into substitute practices that do not break Scripture's teachings but lead to great faithfulness. And what that point is saying is they may be having practices that are culturally normal that are scripturally sinful. And so we can't make excuses to say, well, anthropologically speaking, who am I to say? Well, you're not the one that's saying it. God is saying it through his word to them, and you are the translator. You are the teacher. You are the helper, as it were, to clarify uh, this is wrong, not because it's different from my home culture. This is wrong because God word, God's Word says that uh, you should not sacrifice children. Uh, God's Word says that you should not bow down to a tree, or, or, or whatever the practice may be in a, a given culture. I want to shift gears. Uh, I'm referring now to a blog. Uh, Ed Stetzer, uh, a writer uh, with, the, uh, with Lifeway, uh, which is the uh, publishing arm of the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, wrote an article on his blog, Calling for Contextualization, 
And this was the seventh part, the contextual, contextualization spectrum, which I'm going to talk about too in just a moment. This is referring to the C scale. But uh, just a couple sentences. He, he says, you've heard me say that the how of, mis of ministry is in many ways determined by the who, the when, and the where of culture. What you name a church, how long a worship gathering lasts, the way a church will develop leadership, and much more is shaped in part by culture. Uh, he also quotes Tim Keller, who wrote, A looming crisis for all American evangelical churches is that they cannot thrive outside of the shrinking enclaves of conservative and traditional people and culture. We've not created the new ministry and communication models that will flourish and grow in the coming post-Christian, very secular Western world. Our vision should be to develop campus ministries, new churches, Christian education, discipleship systems that are effective in those fields in North America. And, and I agree with Keller. And interestingly, of course, living in Europe, uh, we actually see what America will look like probably in about a decade. And uh, European uh, cutting-edge church planters are finally getting at how do you reach a, quote, post-Christian, post-modern uh, society. And it's fascinating now we're into second and third generation of postmodern, post-Christian in some of our countries. And, and it's actually refreshing because now we're not having to combat bad models of Christianity. There's basically a vacuum, and when people hear the gospel, it is good news. Uh, but again, uh, Stetzer referenced the C scale, and I want to conclude by just giving a very brief overview. Because in contextualization, in, the, in that whole subject, which is huge, uh, we talk about a spectrum. And in fact, years ago, someone developed what's called the contextualization scale, or the C scale. And there are six different uh, checkpoints on the C scale, and it generally relates to, to work with Muslims. Uh, it can be applied, really, to Hindus or, or any other people group. And I think you'll understand, as I just quickly describe the spectrum from one end to another. C1 is described like this. Missionaries establish a church that's basically identical to wherever they're from. Services are conducted in the language of the missionaries. They call themselves Christians and have very little cultural connection to the region where they plant the church. And I've seen these. Uh, I'm from Texas, so somebody from Texas comes to Europe. They rent a space. They put a pulpit in the front. They preach in English and maybe translate it, maybe not. They sing out the hymnal or the choruses. And it's basically a transplanted church. Uh, back Way back in 1990, I preached on a military base in Berlin. And that was a C1 church. It was an American church that just happened to meet in Germany. Uh, not very contextual, all right? Now take a step over on the spectrum, C2. Uh, it's the same as C1 except the language. That would be uh, a service just like America that meets in Berlin, but it's in German, okay? The trappings are still very much American. Uh, the songs are uh, hymns from American churches. Maybe they're translated into German, but they're not really German hymns. The form is not German. Uh, it's just a transplanted church that's in another language. That's C2. Again, not very contextualized. Uh, C3. Uh, they've incorporated many non-religious cultural forms of the region into their community, such as dress, art, etc., in the Muslim context, they still reject any purely Islamic religious elements. They may meet in a traditional church building or in a more religiously neutral location, a rented uh, room somewhere. They call themselves Christians. And again, for Muslims, that's a huge step. As Christians are the Crusaders, those who, of course, oppressed or killed uh, in their telling of the history. Uh, but it's more contextualized. Uh, what are some examples? Uh, for example, if a Muslim comes to faith and they wear a flowing robe, for example, but there would be some that would say, well, no, that's not what you wear to church. You need to wear slacks, uh, a shirt, and a tie. Well, that would be C1 or 2 to say, well, no, go ahead and wear your flowing robe. You can, you can have your beard. Uh, you can dress. You can avoid pork. You can have some of those external things and still, obviously, be a follower of Christ. So this is an improvement on C1 
in C2, and it's acceptable, we would say, yes, that person could very well be uh, a true Christian, and that gathering could very well be a biblical church. Now, we go further, C4, and listen for differences. Because uh, it's similar to C3, but they incorporate some Islamic religious elements into their community. Even further, uh, they pray more in the Islamic style. They, maybe they put their rugs down, and they kneel down more as the Islamic would do. Uh, they may employ Islamic terminology. Uh, and so instead of calling themselves Christians, they may call themselves followers of Jesus, or in their language, followers of Isa, or something similar. Uh, they may not meet in church buildings. Uh, they may meet on Fridays instead of on Sunday, for example. Uh, and again, they do not consider themselves Muslims, but to all appearances, they appear to be Muslims. And so our organization has generally said, this is as far as we will go and call it orthodox in the sense of proper. Uh, in fact, the easy way to remember that C4 and no more, uh, because it goes even further. C5 would say, this group, they retain their legal and social identity with their Muslim community. If someone asked, they would say they're Muslim. That they reject or reinterpret any part of Islamic practices and doctrine that would contradict the Bible. They may or may not attend the mosque regularly. So they may go to the mosque on Friday and to the church on Sunday. Uh, they actively are involved in sharing their faith uh, with other Muslims. And so there is a witness aspect that would say Islam is incomplete. And so that's not the question. Uh, again, they would view themselves and they're viewed by others as Muslims, though maybe a little unorthodox. We would say that goes too far because their identity now is with what we would consider a false religion. But there are missionaries that disagree and would say, no, that's still very appropriate. They're, they're biblically saved and their groups are biblical churches. And then C6 would be the extreme. Uh, they basically keep their faith secret often because of extreme threat of persecution. Uh, they may worship secretly in small groups. They do not share their faith. And as far as anyone's concerned, they're 100% Muslim. And of course, we would say that is not biblical because one who comes to faith is to be a witness you know, so, so that others can come to faith. So again, that's just a very quick view. But the, the whole subject of contextualization uh, that is what we need to do, whether we're in Texas or we're in Poland or anywhere in the world, is find how we can culturally appropriately, with biblical fidelity, bring the gospel so it has the most effective message to the hearts of the hearer.